Okay, well, we're going to go into our last session of, of looking at this biblical theology thing. <laughs> and um, they've got three passages again, just so we have enough time to kind of discuss and go through. I'm, we're just going to do two again, and I want to focus on the two narrative um, passages. So we're going to look at Luke 4 and John 11 today. Um, but um, I, I do like this. I think you have the quote there. Oh, and has anyone got the page number? 34. 34. So yeah, page 34. I like this quote at the beginning. What is theological reflection? Uh, in simple terms, and then he uses a bunch of huge terms. Um, but basically it's, taking the time to meditate on the text that you're reading and how it relates to God's plan of redemption. It's an exercise that asks how my passage relates to the Bible as a whole, especially to the saving acts of God in Jesus. And so that's what we've been doing this whole time, is learning how to do that, seeing it done for us, and now putting it into practice. Um, so again, you should have, uh, did, did they put the uh, the questions to ask of the text? Yeah. So you've got that. So that's always going to be a good resource for you as you're doing your your own Bible study, just to kind of work through those questions um, and, and, and come up with some answers for them. So I'm going like to look at the narrative. I wanted to do narrative because narrative is very rarely explicit. In, in terms of what it's teaching. Sometimes, for instance, in the Gospels, um, the Gospel writer will say, Jesus said this in order for this, or he said this because of this. or and So they, at times, will give you some, but a lot of the, the, um, the things that we're supposed to learn out of narrative are more implicit, and so I wanted to put that into practice as opposed to they put it in Colossians 1, which is literally a letter that's written to teach people stuff. Um, and it's, yeah, it is it is ex explicit, um, even though it's not always easy to understand, it's more explicit. So I want to start with, um, okay, so yeah, here are our questions. We've got those. Again, keep these in mind. Keep, a, keep those handy whenever you're doing your scripture reading. It's a really good, you know, I always say, Devotionals are good, but it is also so good to do your own Bible reading and study um, and to try and figure the scriptures out yourself. Um, I remember when I was a youth minister many, many years ago, the Oklahoma Baptist State Youth Ministry Office put out what they called the devotional to end all devotionals. And all it was was it started as a very like thought out and methodical thing that you filled out. But as you went through it, and I think it was like a, a month long or maybe 90 days. I forget how long it was. But as you went through it, it was designed to help the students do more and more of the study on their own. So that the idea was by the time they get to the end of it, you don't have to buy a devotional every time you want to study the scriptures. Which, again, it's fine to do that. But if that's the only thing we're doing... All we're ever getting is what other people think about the scriptures. So, all that, that's my soapbox to say, read the scriptures yourself, try and work through these questions, and you'll be, you'll be surprised at, at what you see if you're, if you're doing that. Um, but we're going to start today in Luke chapter 4, so let's open up there. It's a familiar passage, I think it's one that we've even kind of talked about, but Luke chapter 4. And we're going to read verses 1 through 13. Um, so would someone like to read verses 1 through 13? Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by, and was led by the Spirit in the desert, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man does not live on bread alone. The devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. 
And he said to them, I will give you all their authority and splendor, for it has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. So if you worship me, it will be yours. Jesus answered, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve, all, serve him only. The devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, Throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. Jesus answered, It says, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished all his tempting, he left him until an opportune time. Okay. So, let's start with our question. What's the point? What's the point of this passage? Yeah, that's a good place to start. I'm just telling that to just be a decision. It's just Satan's Satan's not going to win. I see it as like know your scripture because Jesus is quoting. Right. Yeah, that's a big part of it too, is that Satan comes to Jesus um with temptation and Jesus how does Jesus defeat that temptation? He he responds by quoting the scriptures. And if Jesus starting his ministry, I'm thinking that he has to uh, show that uh, you know he's in command. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know how to say it properly, but you know that he can be tempted by anyone, and he can still you know. Yeah, there's part of that too that, you know, it's important that the scripture tells us that, or shows to us that Jesus, it's not like Jesus had a cakewalk going through earth. It was, you know, there were there were difficult things. He was in, was it Hebrews? And it says Jesus was tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. So when we face temptation, Jesus knows what it's like to face temptation. And that's one way that we know that he knows what we're going through. As he faced, he's, it said he's tempted in every way as we are. So the, every category of temptation that we face, Jesus faced in his life. So, yeah, this is, um, this is how they put it here, and I like this. Jesus, retempt, Jesus resists Satan's temptations through his dependence on the Father, which is displayed in his trust in the Scriptures. So yeah, that's 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 a big part of what's going on here. And our next question would be, where does this fall in the biblical storyline? Patrick's already made allusion to it. What did Patrick say? This is when. Yeah, so this is the this is the New Testament, obviously, and it's at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. So, when we think about that in the storyline, what had been happening before Jesus was born? That's a very broad question. Yeah, what do you want to know? <laughs> Name some things. Like, like, wait, you mean like, like, so like right before he was born? Yeah, Old Testament. Testament yeah. Just right. name some things and we will talk about it. Okay. Well, and we finished, yeah, we finished last week with Nehemiah where you have the Jews that came back, but what did we see? At the end of Nehemiah, they were still breaking God's commands. They were still, even though God had recongregated them in Jerusalem and had provided protection for them and miraculous protection for them, they, the amount of time that it took them to rebuild, rebuild the wall was, was miraculous, 
Yeah, we still saw. They still can't follow God. <laughs> and and from that time, it's it's almost huh? Sorry. I didn't know you were about to say what I was about to say. Say what you're about to say. Well, okay, then from that time, the point where even after looking back. Anyway, God stops meeting. Yeah. Yeah, you've got 400 years. 400 years of absolute quiet. Yeah. And so we've had here, you know, we've had the birth of John the Baptist, um, and then we've had the ministry of John the Baptist, what we have before this in Luke. That's the first time there's been a prophet um, in, in centuries. And then now we have Jesus beginning his ministry. Um, so yeah, this is when you when you take into account you know the history, like it gives you an even bigger picture of the importance of what's going on. Now, not only is God speaking, God is dwelling among them, um, and for a people that had not heard from God in four hundred years, this should be a cause for celebration. Yeah. So this one, there's so many things with this question. There's so many potential answers, and we're going to look at these. But how, obviously, I mean, this, this story is about Jesus. <laughs> so how does it point to Christ is a, is a pretty simple thing. It's like, well, this is, you know, this is Jesus. So. But there's more that this points to about who Jesus is um, and what he's doing. So... Um, so that we've got different different options here. So we've talked about typology. Um, is there any kind of typology that you all see here? Anything from the Old Testament that Jesus might be fulfilling? Um, yeah, he is. I, I would say that's not specific. Well, not specifically the point of this passage, although in part it can be. Oh, we're, yeah, we're, yeah. Temptation of Jesus. So Jesus in the wilderness being tempted. Um, so, so as, as I call it the pattern, if you look at the pattern, what does it remind us of? You have the Son of God who goes into the wilderness and faces temptation to turn away from God. So if I give you those three things, yeah, what is that? What does that sound like? Yeah, it sounds like Israel. Um, only Jesus spent forty days in the wilderness out of obedience, whereas Israel spent forty years for disobedience. Um, but there's a uh, so Christ is the what we call the anti-type, which. That's the weird word because it sounds like he's not the type, but anti-type means the the fulfillment of the type, not something that's against the type. I don't know why. I don't know why. That's just that's just what it is. I meant to I actually meant to change that to fulfillment, and I forgot to do that. Um, so Christ is the fulfillment of Israel. Um, so unlike Israel, which failed in the wilderness, Jesus has proven to be the faithful Son of God. So remember when we talked about this idea of the Son of God, Israel was called a Son of God. So, while we're looking, let's go back um, into chapter 3. Um, someone read in, in chapter 3, verses 21 and 22. That same uh, yeah, Luke chapter 3, verse 21 to 22. Okay. Now it came about when all the people were baptized, that Jesus also was baptized. And while he was praying, heaven was opened, and the Spirit descended upon him, in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came out of heaven, Thou art my beloved Son, and thee I am well pleased. Okay, so here we've, we've talked about this. Jesus is the Son of God. Now, go forward to the very last, so we have right after that, so Jesus, you are my beloved son, with him I'm well pleased, right after that we have this genealogy of Jesus that Luke does. What did, somebody read the last verse of chapter 3. So, Enos, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. 
Okay, so Jesus is the Son of God, who's descended from the Son of God. Now, go back to him, go back to chapter 4, and someone read Satan's first thing he said to Jesus. This is in verse 3. Someone read that. If you are the Son of God. Yeah. So, we have God saying, Jesus, this, this is my Son. Then Luke says, look at this genealogy. It shows that he is, he is the Son of God. And then Satan's first challenge to Jesus is, if you are the Son of God, so it's an attack on who Jesus is. And Israel was also referred to as a Son of God. We talked about that. And so, yes, that's, that's why this is big, because where Israel failed in the wilderness, Jesus succeeded. Not only that, what did, what did Israel receive every morning in manna? They were fed in the wilderness. What did Jesus do in the wilderness? He starved. He, um, he ate nothing during those days. So Jesus... He was hungry. I like this. He was hungry. Yes, and when they were ended, he was hungry. I think of that. Yeah. 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 And I want to last. Yeah. 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 So Jesus is at an even bigger disadvantage in Israel because Israel was being provided for by God whereas Jesus was not eating anything. Um, another thing that we see um, in chapter 3 um, where Jesus is baptized says, the, this is verse 22, the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. So this is one of the, one of the passages, one of the verses that gives us our idea of the Trinity. Because you have Jesus in the water, God speaking, this is my Son, and the Holy Spirit coming down in bodily form. So we have our picture of the Trinity, but we also see that while Jesus was on the earth, he, he was led by the Spirit the same way that we are called to be led by the Spirit. He did not cease to be God, but he set that part of himself aside is what Philippians 2 tells us, that he made himself nothing. He did not cling to his rights as God. And so as a man, he was led by the Spirit. And we see that in chapter 4, verse 1. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness for 40 days. So when we are commanded to live and to be led by the Spirit, that's the same thing that Jesus displayed and um, was an example of for us. So, like I said, there's uh, the tons of stuff. Is the reason he's mentioned his genealogy is to show that he is human and he has this lineage. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, that's a big part. And... It's interesting because in Matthew, when Matthew does Jesus' genealogy, Matthew stops at Abraham because Matthew is writing to Jews. But Luke is writing to Greeks. He takes it back to Abraham because who's included under Abraham? All of humanity. So Jesus is not just Jewish. He is a descendant also of Adam. And that's important because that means he saves all of humanity, not just the Jews. Sorry. Say takes it back to Adam or Abraham. I think Luke takes it. Back. Yeah, Luke takes it back to Adam. Yes. Yes. In my head, I thought you said Abraham. You I don't know. I might have. Yeah. You might have said the other one. But I might have. I was still thinking of the other one. Sorry. Okay. No, that's okay. <laughs> Making sure I'm on the right track. So thematically, what what do we, what kind of things do we see with Jesus? Um. And this one is not. You don't have to get super creative or. <laughs> But what is, what is Jesus displaying, or what themes do we see um, as we read this passage on Jesus in the wilderness? Temptation. There's temptation. We see his authority. Authority. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the way they put it and I, is uh, they talk about faithfulness to God. Jesus is faithful um, in the... Yeah, and so Jesus stays faithful to God. Uh, 
Um, okay, and then we've talked about this God, man, Christ response, a kind of texture of the gospel. Um, so the question, if, if we're considering this passage, and we're particularly talking about Jesus and Israel, with whom should we identify in this story? Yeah, we, we need to be like Israel. Oh, I didn't write that down. But it is Israel. Israel failed in the wilderness. Jesus succeeded. And so, yes, we need to we need to know the scriptures and we need to be dependent on the Spirit and we need to pray so that we can overcome temptation. But we know that we're going to fail. And so what we really need is someone who never failed. And that leads us to how do we read this text through Christ? And in other words, what does it what does it mean for us? And so that's since we are like Israel, we need Christ's faithfulness to become our own. So yeah, we are we are more likely to be the people who grumble against God. Even after after he's provided for us over and over and preserved us. Um, And so, you know, we can't, we can't fulfill these, these things the way Jesus did. And so we need someone who did. Any questions or thoughts on, on that? Can you go over the beginning of the lesson that I missed? I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I always thought of the second temptation of like Jesus, Satan saying to Jesus, like, hey, worship me and I'll give you all these things. And it's like, knowing that all of these were a temptation, it's, it, it's an interesting thought because maybe in his weakness he was like, well, am I don't know. I don't know what is was going on through Jesus' mind. But it doesn't actually seem like knowing that Jesus is the creator of all things, that God has already promised all things are Jesus anyways. It's like, how is that a temptation? Knowing, like, you're the lesser, like, you, Satan, you're, you're a created being. Yeah. I created you, and you're saying for me to worship you. Anyway, and so I've always wondered, like, why, why is that? Why did the devil say, I'm going to tempt him? Could it huh. be that his earthly kingdom is to come later and he was like saying, well, I can give it to you early now? Yeah, I think there's some of that. I think that's something where we can also, we need to remember that Jesus was one person with two natures. Yes. Jesus has a human nature and a divine nature. And so that human nature is subject to some of those desires. Now, so this is where we can kind of get into the weeds. We have to remember, Jesus did not have a corrupted nature like we do. So we are born with a sinful nature. That's So we, we are born with a bent towards sin. So Jesus' human nature would have been more like Adam and Eve, who were tempted, but they had no, they had nothing inside them that led them to sin against God until they sinned against God. Um, and so that the temptation was exterior, it was not interior. So and so that was the same, that was true of Jesus as well. He had those exterior temptations, but it was not an interior temptation like we have because we have uh, a, a corrupted, sinful um, person. So it it was an attempt to basically do Satan to do what he did with Adam and Eve to Jesus, which is don't worship God, you know, worship me or, or do it. Just don't worship God. And now, as Lori said, now he is the greater Adam. Yes, and so yes, that's where he succeeds. Um, you know, this is this is kind of a double thing because you also. Israel didn't specifically have an encounter with Satan in the wilderness, but we know that Adam and Eve did have an encounter. So Jesus is getting hit on on two fronts there, um, and um, and so he is 
fulfilling what Adam should have been, he's also fulfilling what Israel should have been. Um, so, yeah, that's, yeah. It's just a, yeah. Yeah. And that one's, that one's tough because then it's like, well, did Jesus really, did he really experience, he did experience temptation as we do, but not in the same way. Otherwise, he wouldn't be able to, to save us if he, if he had that interior corrupted will that we have. Okay, um, let's go on. We're going to look at John chapter 11 now. And this, I wanted to save time because this one, just to read it, is going to, um, it takes a, an amount of time. We're not going to read the whole chapter. We're going to read the, the Lazarus narrative. Um, so, John chapter 11, somebody read... Verses 1 through 16. Now, a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and his sister Martha. It was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair. His brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore the sisters said to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, Let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, lately the Jews sought to stone you, and are you going, to the, are you going there again? Jesus answered, are there not twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble, because he sees the light of this world. But if one walks in the night, he stumbles, because the light is not in him. These things he said, and after that he said to them, Our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him. When his disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he will, he will get well. However, Jesus spoke of his death. But they thought that he was speaking about taking rest and sleep. Then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there, that you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go to him. Then Thomas, who is called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. Okay, someone pick up and read 17 through 27. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, less than two miles away. Many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them about their brother. As soon as Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him, but Mary remained seated in the house. Then Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Yet even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Your brother will rise again, Jesus told her. Martha said to him, I know that you will rise again in the resurrection of the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me, even if he dies, will live. Everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she told him. I believe you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who comes into the world. Okay. Uh, keep going. Someone, verse 28 through whatever that is, 37. When she said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, The teacher is here and is calling for you. When she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, Where are you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews said, See how he loved him. 
But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of a blind man also have kept this man from dying? All right, someone keep going. Next section, 38 through 44. I'll do that one. Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I know, I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips, and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. And let's go ahead, we'll read to the, anyone want to read just to the end of the chapter from there? Many therefore of the Jews who had come to Mary and beheld what he had done, believed in him. But some of them went away to the Pharisees and told them the things which Jesus had done. You want to keep going? Right? Yeah, all the way to the end of the right, chapter. Conspiracy to the, kill Jews, sorry. Therefore, the, the chief priests and the Pharisees convened the council and we're saying, what are we doing? For this man is performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, all men will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. But a certain one of them, Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all, nor do you take into account that it is expedient for you that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation should not perish. Now this he did not say on his own initiative, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus was going to die for the nation, and not for the nation only, but that he might also gather together into one, of the, into one the children of God who were scattered abroad. So from that day on they planned together to kill him. Jesus therefore no longer continued to walk publicly among the Jews, but went away from there to the country near the wilderness, into a city called Ephraim, and there he stayed with the disciples. Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and many went up to Jerusalem, out of the country before the Passover, to purify themselves. Therefore they were seeking for Jesus, and were saying to one another, as they stood in the temple, What do you think, that he will not come to the feast at all? Now the chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders that if anyone knew where he was, he should report that they might seize him. Okay. All right, so what what do you think the point of this passage is? Okay. No, that's good. It's it's the identity of Jesus and our belief in his identity. So, um, you know, Jesus tells Martha, she said, yes, I know that he will rise at the resurrection on the last day. And Jesus says to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? So this is a, this is a passage that is showing us who Jesus is and showing it's connecting that to our belief in him. Um, so, yes, he's saying, yes, there will be a resurrection, but that resurrection comes through me, through belief in me. 
so it's a big story and yes there there are many other things we could point out as as kind of points that are being you know we read a whole chapter you know there's but that i would say that is the overriding purpose of this passage Unintentionally, even Caiaphas was yeah. saying the yeah. identity of Jesus, and in essence, what that identity like. Right. So, except it was more of an indictment on himself. <laughs> right. Yeah, they were saying that they were concerned that the Romans would come and destroy them because of Jesus, and so it's better that Jesus dies so that the whole nation doesn't die. <laughs> yeah, um, but they didn't realize what they were actually. Saying so again, like I said, sometimes the gospel writers <laughs> will tell us because it's like he said this, um, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation and not for the nation only, but also to gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. So John takes a second and saying, "Look, this is important. Like this is, you know, like I said, it doesn't happen often when you're looking at narrative, but it does. It does happen. So." Important question, where does this fall in the biblical storyline? Obviously, this is in the ministry of Jesus. Yeah. So, I mean, we get that. If you keep reading, obviously, you would get that. But it it says there in verse 55, the Passover of the Jews was at hand. We know Jesus was arrested and crucified during the Passover. Um, and so that gives a lot of import into this. Um. So it's right. Bef- it's literally right before he's about to be crucified. Things are things are building up to um, to to what's going to happen. And that they went as far as like gave orders that if anyone knew where he was, they should let him know. Like, yeah. Huh? 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 Where Jesus is? <laughs> Sorry. I don't know why I've never read it like this. Like, have I never read? John 11, I feel like I have, but I've never seen it detailed like this, like the fact that the high priest keeps, now this he did not say of his own authority, and like the part of, he's gonna, you know, he must die for yeah. all of the children of God who are scattered abroad. I'm like, I didn't know what he had yeah, I mean, oftentimes when these stories are taught, they They've teach just a very particular part, yeah. portion, and they don't. So yeah, it's easy to miss that stuff. I didn't even know that Jesus like stopped being out in public. Like I thought until the day he died, he was just like miracles, 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 healing, right? Feeding. Uh-huh. And then it said that he actually went into the wilderness and wasn't being as public. Yeah. Before that makes sense why he was being persecuted. We were like, if you find him, like, oh, this like a lot of blood being shed in the thirties. Uh-huh. Oh, you're right? good. Not good. <laughs> Earlier. Yeah, so and so how does it point to Christ? This one's pretty easy. <laughs> we have I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. That's this is a pretty easy one. How does it point to Christ? I mean it it is it shows both by Jesus' words and his actions that Jesus has power over death. So this is something culturally Um, at least in Judaism at that time, I don't know if it was generally in the ancient world, but in Judaism, there was a belief that the soul stuck around the body for three days. That you weren't really dead until you were dead for three days, which is why Jesus, it was important for Jesus to be dead for for be three days. Yeah, three Jewish days. In order for them to believe, because otherwise they wouldn't have Believe. Right, they would have said, oh, well, he wasn't really, really dead. dead. Yeah, and he was really dead. And he so dead. we see it here. Jesus says, roll the stone away. And Martha says, Lord, it's been four days. He's gonna smell bad in so there. it's going to smell bad. So Jesus has raised other people from the dead, but they've all been dead less than three days. Every other person that he's raised has been dead less than three days. So there was some am- amount of where people could say, oh, well, you know, they weren't really dead. I mean, certainly it was a miracle because those things don't happen all the time. But day four is, that's big. And that's, that's why you see, it's, it's such a weird verse. He says, um, 
Oh gosh, where is it? Yeah, it's in verse 6 of chapter 11. When he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Yeah, there's a reason for that. Yeah, which again, when you see something like that, and you're like, that's weird. It ought to say, okay, this might be a clue for something else that's going to happen later. So when Martha says it's been four days, and you know Jesus stayed intentionally two days, when he could have, and, and you see the faith of Mary and Martha, there is no question in their mind that if Jesus had been there, that Lazarus would not have died. There's no question in their mind. So they are displaying great faith, but they're thinking like four days, that's it. Um, that's, you know, yeah. How does this then relate when uh, Jesus rises on the third day? So that gets into the Jewish concept of days. They don't think of it where we do the 24-hour day. Um, and so the third day is essentially three days. Um, so it's, it's, it's how they conceived of time because it, 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 it gets into... So like their day started at sundown the night before. So he was dead Friday... Friday Oh, this clears so many things up. You know so even though he died on Friday, that counts he was Friday. dead Friday. Saturday, and then Sunday, the whole day, he was, but he rose. So it's... Even though he wasn't dead even, all of Sunday. Yeah, he was... was Sunday. He was dead on Sunday. So that's, he rose after being dead for three. It's how they conceived of days. Well, I just meant that the position between the four days and the three days, four days saying he's dead... Three days. Oh. Right. Well, they, you, you, it was on the third day, basically, that you were like dead, dead. So the fourth day is like extra dead. Extra dead. <laughs> yeah. He stinks dead. Yeah. Yeah, but Martha said. Yeah, that's for the Lazarus. Yeah. Yeah, Lazarus truly was dead. Yeah. He can't. And one of my favorite. Parts of the story, this is totally extra, but, um, you know, there's a plot to kill Jesus. In chapter 12, we have where Mary anoints Jesus at Bethany. Um, and so then there's a plot to kill Lazarus in verse 9. But I like this in verse 2. It says, so they gave a dinner for him there. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at the table. Lazarus is relaxed. You know, people know they're trying to kill Jesus, and Lazarus is with Jesus. But Lazarus has already been dead. <laughs> and he knows, he knows who rules over death. So Lazarus, you know, I don't, you know, he's like, what, are they going to kill me? I, 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 know what's, I know what's going on. So I, anyway, that's just one of my favorite things. Um, so yeah, so that's how it points to Christ. How do we read this through Christ? Um, I've put it up there. I didn't mean to, you may have seen it, but how does it point us to Christ? Well, I'm seeing it like when scripture says that we are dead in our trespasses and sin, like we're as dead, like as impossible and as dead as Lazarus was, that is, that is our souls. Yeah, that is how spirits live. Where it is utterly impossible for any kind of life. Or, like, it's very obvious Lazarus couldn't have raised himself. He needed right. something outside of himself to speak life into him. And, like, whenever we see that in our own dead states, we're like, we're, gosh, there's just so much hope in Jesus. Like, it is only. Jesus, who can raise the dead to life, the spiritually dead, because you can't get any deader than that. <laughs> yeah, this is, I mean, Paul says this in Ephesians 2, says, um, and you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience 
among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, what does it say? Made us alive. He resurrected us. So what we see, this is, this is what it is, Lazarus gives us a foretaste of our own resurrection. We have already been spiritually resurrected from our spiritual death that comes through sin. And that points to the physical resurrection that we will have on that last day. If, if the Lord does not return before we die, we will, just in the same way that Jesus called Lazarus out of death, he will call us out of death. Yeah. I, I read a comment. I, it's so funny because I actually just read John 11. Like, quiet time this morning. Oh, that's <laughs> funny. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> but, <see> this. <laughs> <laughs> the notes were saying that Jesus had to say, like, Lazarus, come out. Otherwise, like, who knows how many dead people? Yeah. When he died, dead people did come out of the ground. Yeah, we yeah. see that at the yeah. when Jesus died, that there were people I, that were resurrected. Yeah. Kind of so Mary didn't do the hair thing until after Lazarus was brought from the yeah. dead, but they talk about it in eleven. John's not chronological. What, oh, John is right? just throwing facts out there ahead of time. <laughs> what do they talk about in? That's a second story, right? No, no um, she did it twice. When she, what she what are you talking about? Yeah, so in John eleven, he starts talking about Mary and her sister Martha, and then he's like, "It was that Mary who anointed Jesus' feet with oil in her." Mm -hmm. But, but then, then in twelve, in 12 yeah. after he's been resurrected, right now he's she's doing it. Did she do it twice, or was he just talking about it? He's again? talking about it later, talking about the 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 following event. So I have to remember, this was written at a time. This was written at a time where these people were still alive, mm -hmm. and these people were known. And so, so he was, so he was saying it was this was. Mary. It was that Mary. Yeah. But she hadn't and done it she yet. She hadn't done it, and then she does it in uh, the next. One thing that we see, to, or at least in, in Mark, it shows the relationship that Jesus has with Mary and Martha and Lazarus. Like, it wasn't just like, oh, this is the one time that, visit, that Jesus visits them. There, it seems to be evidence that oh, oftentimes when he was in that region, he would go and stay. And right, because there was also family. there was also Mary Magdalene. There were there were others. So there was you know yes. just like we would clarify, it was this John Smith, mm -hmm. not that John Smith. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so yeah, that's 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 what it okay, is. So but that's a good question. Her. It doesn't mean that she had already done it. Right. Yeah. Because yeah. so he's after, writing after the death and resurrection of life. Yeah. That's what's right. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, if I was writing a story about, I don't know, someone famous today, I would say it's this person who did this, even if it later in the story is when it actually did it. So, um, okay, so yeah, I mean that, and that's a good place for us to end on um, today, and you know, since this is our last day, is, is our hope in the resurrection. That, that is, you know... That resurrection only comes through Christ. And so that is our that is the only hope that is worth having. And so that is a good thing for us to to focus on. Um, and for and to and to commend to each other that like our, our hope is in Christ. He's made us alive spiritually. He will make us eternally alive. Um on that on that last day um, and so there's there's not much better we could do as we part than to say believe, believe in Christ trust in Christ um, and in the hope of that resurrection um, that's to come yes I think that 12 verse 2 that how you said how relaxed Lazarus was Lazarus yeah. was like that confidence that he has in Christ like we have that yeah. Even whenever we see so much craziness in the world, um, 
But again, there's nothing new under the sun. It's always been crazy since Genesis 3. But in that, like you said, Lazarus isn't fearing. Yeah. Because of his hope in Christ and his confidence in Christ. And so we too do not have to fear. So we do not have to, um, yeah, we, we do not have to uh, worry about the days to come. Like, if we are in Christ, we are his, we, uh, we have been made alive in Christ now, and death is not, nothing to fear yeah. in the future because... So yeah, don't, you know, God has not given us a spirit of fear. Um, you know, we can face uncertain days. We, uh, we can face anything confident knowing that God is in control of all things and that even if something bad happens to us personally, you know, our last passage today shows that we know that Christ will call us out of death um, and that we will live forever with him if we've placed our faith in him. So, so cling to Christ. That's that's the only, that's what I hopefully have consistently called us to do, and that's the, the, the best thing that I can I can close with. There's a 